dealing with a falsehood, you're faced with two options. You can accept it or you can reject it. The basis upon which we take one of these actions is a product of our critical thinking capabilities and a desire to know what is true instead of confirming our bias. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. On Brainstorm, we choose the hard truths over the comforting lies. Reason, compassion, skepticism, this is the Brainstorm Podcast. folks welcome to the brainstorm podcast skeptic studio the interview portion of the brainstorm podcast where we talk to a variety of folks with the intent to spread critical thinking compassion and skepticism i'm Corey, and my panel for this interview were lisa and renee and we recorded it on march 15th 2019 remember that if you want to contact us about the show then you can do that by emailing us at mail at brainstormblog.net or if you want to support the show then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast in this interview, we talked to Jan- Jonathan Maloney, who runs the website IntelligenceSpeculation.com, which is dedicated to critical thinking. So, I hope you enjoy it. If you like what we're doing and want to help us keep the lights on, go become a patron at Patreon.com forward slash Brainstorm Podcast. You can hear the bonus half hour that we record every episode and get a shout out when you support the show. Become a patron for just a dollar an episode at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. Or you can support the show by ordering a t-shirt, mug or other gear from our store at cafepress.ca forward slash brainstorm podcast gear. If you can't afford to become a patron or buy gear, then why not give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Every rating makes it easier for people to find us. Thanks for your support. We're here with Jonathan Maloney uh, from the website intelligentspeculation.com. And I guess, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background there, Jonathan? Yeah, okay. So I'm I'm like a huge science nerd. Uh, I have been basically my entire life. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD candidate in theoretical physics at uh, Northern Illinois University. So it's just a it's just a local state school. And I like my history, other than being like a huge science nerd and how I kind of got involved with intelligent speculation is that I have a parent uh, that, and I was raised under the household um, with the impression that both like vaccines and genetically modified food, that these were things that I needed to be scared about. A lot of conspiracy theory type thinking. Uh, I ended up working, yeah, I ended up working in the complementary and alternative health field for a number of years. Wow. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, I'm intimately aware of all of the, kind of paranoia and just the misinformation that floats around these crowds. And I'm not going to say that all of it is bad, but there's just a lot of pseudoscientific nonsense. And given my experience with actually working in the industry and then having a strong science background, eventually I realized that some of these views that I was taught that I continued to harbor into my adult life such as being like being irrationally fearful surrounding genetically modified foods or GMOs and vaccines that these were indeed wrong. And I mean, I spent years trying to justify, justify my wrong, what ended up being wrong positions using what I thought was reasonable science. But uh, yeah, it was, it's been an interesting journey and that's kind of how I came to found intelligent speculation is I feel that there's just a bunch of, nonsense out there people have access to so much information these days right at right at their fingertips and we just don't have adequate filters the average person doesn't have an adequate filter to decipher between the good and the bad Uh, so that's why i developed um like the laws of critical thinking what does it mean to be a critical thinker like what in my opinion 
the average person needs to know in order to help um, to help them cipher through through all the nonsense and to make sure that they're not falling uh, falling for all of the craziness out there. How do you how did that process that transition happen for you? Was it yeah? What what do, what do you what what do you think got you to change your your point of view? So as I as as I had said um, before, I spent years trying to justify these positions. So I would get into repeated like online arguments with people like on Reddit or Facebook, trying to justify my positions. And I always was coming up empty handed in the long run. Like I couldn't, I had to walk away from these debates because I just couldn't justify my position with evidence. Uh, I mean, that didn't change my mind, but what eventually, I, I suppose what eventually made me realize what I was wrong is as I, as I dug deeper into logic. Um, so that's a subset of philosophy. And I learned more about the structure of an argument. I learned more about logical fallacies. Uh, in particular, I learned about cherry picking. And how essentially what I was doing through all of my arguments was just cherry picking because I was only looking at the evidence that supported my position. So essentially it was the, it was confirmation bias guiding me towards cherry picking. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess my and, question, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say my question was rooted um, in, I guess, in my own experience because I would say I had a bunch of maybe some very woo-ish sort of ideas as I went into um, university, but I did multiple degrees in physics and I, like, as you said that you're doing degree in physics and I just feel like physics doesn't yeah. tolerate bullshit well. It doesn't tolerate, like it just, you just, and it wasn't that anyone who sat me down mm-hmm. and was like, no, there's no God. Like, no, no, like, that never, it wasn't like direct indoctrination. It was like, well, you know, it's just very... I don't know. It, you just, you, you, everything's so logic based and everyone's just so, it's everything so evidence based and, and so analytical. You just can't help but, I don't know. I, I thought that's my experience. I was just wondering if, uh, if that maybe was part of your experience. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously the, the scientific training to some degree and like being surrounded by peers and talking about these ideas and whatnot. You know, I got some crazy looks at times. Other people, other people not so much, but, I mean, it wasn't so much the the physics at, at the end of the day that did it for me, but it was my own personal exploration of logic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had never taken logic formally. You kind of learn, I mean, you, you implicitly learn logic uh, to a degree just through um, just through scientific training. And of course, we, we learn mathematical logic as, as kids um, through K, K, K through 12, but uh, it was really learning traditional philosophical logic, I think, that really kind of pushed me over the edge into like, yeah, I'm completely wrong uh, and kind of realizing why I was wrong. You're one of these crazy people who like taking the logic courses. I knew a lot of physics majors who took the logic courses because it's how they could get their humanities credits without actually having to take like it's to talk about <laughs> feelings or interpret an essay, you know, a novel or a poem or whatever. All they had to do was like learn logic. They're like, perfect. It's like math, but in humanities. Like they were so happy about that. <laughs> nice. so, I avoided those classes. I'm like, I want archaeology. Like, I was like <laughs> that's cool too. That's- <laughs> Archaeology is yeah, awesome. No, I, um, I actually, ne- I, like I said, I, I didn't take it formally. I took it all informally because um, I kept encountering, I originally in- encountered logical fallacies. Like people were talking about logical fallacies when I was getting into online debates, I don't mm-hmm. know, like seven or eight years ago on Reddit. And that's when, that's kind of when I went like deep and hard into logic. Like- and then eventually I stumbled across cognitive biases and just have been completely enthralled with like overall like decision optimization since then. So I'm not saying there's like any good social media or healthy social media, but I feel like Reddit is kind of like just a little bit better. You know what I mean? Like, like people like write mostly complete sentences and I don't know. Am I crazy? Do you, do you find that? No, I mean, yeah, it's a mixed bag with social media, but like if you're going to engage in debates or discourses on social media, I mean, I recommend either using Facebook or Reddit. Those are the two platforms that are best for that, in my opinion. Yeah, probably not Twitter. Um, yeah, but Facebook <laughs> yeah, is just definitely. me arguing with my aunt about like whatever <laughs> right. climate change. I don't, it's just not. <laughs> there's too many people you know, and it's just not even. The worst is YouTube comments. 
<laughs> Don't argue with people in YouTube comments. Man, yeah. That's where you truly weep for humanity. Yeah, it's YouTube comments <laughs> are the worst. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, YouTube's really, really bad. I mean, Facebook can be really bad too. I mean, I've seen, I've, I've seen it all though. I mean, I've had respectful discourses on both Facebook and Reddit, mm. and then I've had some really, I've just had some that just completely derail and you know the name, the name calling and oh for sure, yeah, just, just trying to belittle you out of the conversation and whatnot. So even from very smart people, I mean, you can tell that they are. Uh, highly intelligent and they're articulating their points correctly, but they get frustrated because you don't understand immediately. So then they, mm. they berate you. And so that's uh, me. Uh, oh, you, you are in theoretical <laughs> physics. That's, that was my experience in physics as well. <laughs> that's how I you am on Twitter. He goes, <laughs> Twitter's so, the worst though. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter. Uh, I mean, Twitter is just sound, like little sound sound bites here and there. I mean, I, I've never tried to engage in really anything on Twitter other than people that ap- absolutely insist on being unreasonable than like say, saying some sort of nonsense on my predict- on my um, Twitter profile yeah. that I'll have to. And I try to I try to keep it as short and to the point as possible because I don't like, I don't like having to tweet out multiple, re- multiple replies to somebody. It, it's just a headache. It, it's a nightmare. Yeah. It's just not a good platform for that. So how long have you yeah, been? I mean, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, that's basically kind of how yeah. I got into all of this is, uh, is that I, I mean, the real impetus was that I was born into a family that was anti-vaccine, anti-GMO. And then I grew out of that through science and logic. So were you one of the kids who had to vaccinate themselves eventually? No. Uh, I mean, as an adult, I ha- obviously had to make sure that I was getting my own vaccines. But my, uh, I mean, my, my mom and dad made sure to get all of our vaccines. Like we had all of our childhood vaccines. And that was just bizarre that so it was my mother as, as, as an adult like in her practice and whatnot. Like she was just completely anti-vaccine. And I was like, I don't. I don't really understand it. And then obviously when you have, so she was, she's a doctor and she has these pseudoscientific, these pseudoscientific worldviews. Um, as a child, you know, you look up to your parents and you look to them, you look to them for advice. Like here is my mother, you know, I'm looking to her for guidance and she's also a doctor. So she holds a a position of prestige. So therefore, you know, she can't be wrong. Something's got to be going on here. Uh, So there's all of this, cognitive dissonance coming into play like i have to justify which is why i think too it took me so long to finally come around to realize admitting that i was wrong is because then i also had to admit that to a degree that that my my mother was wrong and felt you know feeding me all of this nonsense so so that was that was difficult what's thanksgiving dinner like for you now then you know, we talk about it a little bit. Um, my mother and I have a, a very cold, cordial relationship. Um, and she just, she kind of respects, she, re- she respects what I'm doing with my life. And she obviously doesn't agree. But then again, I, at this point, I mean, I, I don't know if I, there's anything that I could tell her to change her mind. So generally, we just don't bring these things up. Ah. <laughs> uh. Like religion, politics, vaccines. Those are the three topics we one doesn't talk <laughs> yeah, about in right. company, right? Well, that and mercury fillings. And so, mercury fillings. Oh, geez. She was a dentist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She was a dentist. So, uh, but yeah, it's just kind of one of those where it's not like we don't talk or anything like that. It's, we just don't, these, when we are together, we, we generally don't talk about these things anymore. Okay. Sorry. Stupid question. Are mer- mercury fillings Okay. I don't know. I've never looked into or thought about it. I didn't know it was a thing. <laughs> okay. So, you know, okay. So the silver, mil- the silver fillings in your mouth or whatever, they're silver in color. Yeah. 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 They're, yeah. Yeah. They're approximately 50% mercury. Okay. And the average, oh, the average person can tolerate them just fine because at the end of the day, it's the dose that makes the poison, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the average person can tolerate them just fine. There are certain subsets of people who are hypersensitive to it and they can't tolerate it. But that's not the average person. Just like any other sort of medical intervention where you will have a certain subset of people that will experience adverse reactions or side effects, 
uh, you have the same thing going but on. What's the adverse reaction the with, fillings. with mercury? It's like you get too much and you're just kind of fucked. Like there's no, and yeah. it's cumulative. You don't like, you just kind of get more and more until your brain's fucked. And then you're, so that means that kind of a scary yeah, risk. So, yeah. So if you are one of those people where you don't excrete mercury well, um, you're in like, a, it's again, it's a small percentage based mm. off of what the studies say. You don't realize it until you start to unfortunately experience mercury poisoning symptoms, which is there's no cure I mean, for it's neurological. It's, <laughs> well, no, no, it's neurological and psychological. So once once you're able to identify that, yeah, you are one of these people, you don't excrete mercury too terribly well, then you can get the amalgam fillings removed. Uh, and then once you remove the source, your body will slowly start to detox itself. Um, we'll slowly, yeah, slowly okay. start to detox itself naturally. I thought the mercury was cumulative. There's, there's, there's like you also, never lost also, it. You just, it stayed in your brain forever or whatever. Am I crazy? I don't think so. No, I th- they have mercury chelators out there for like mine workers because my certain types of mine workers are exposed to mercury and they experience mercury mm. poisoning symptoms and then they, um, they can give them these chelators which bind the mercury and then they help, it helps to excrete them. But no, I don't think that. I don't think you're screwed forever. Yeah, I, I feel so actually... much better. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I, any of this I mean, stuff. I also, I also should say that I'm not an expert, an absolute expert in this. This is everything that I learned from yeah. uh, working with my mother. Who one of the things she does, one of the things that she did was remove these mercury fillings, and at least this is this is what I had read, and this is what this is what I was told. All right, man. Well, you have more research than me. Interesting. Thank you. Sorry. I was just like, tell me more about this thing that I don't know about. No, yeah. It's fun. You know, I work in, in, uh, medical, uh, such like whatever work in cancer care we take CT scans and we don't like metal fillings because it makes big artifacts in our CTs. Mm. Pain in the ass. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's how, that's my experience with fillings. Make goddamn artifacts. Make- Makes sense. Well, they're going to be obsolete soon. And actually, fillings overall will be obsolete probably within the next 20 to 30 years because of stem cell. Really? Uh, stem cell research. Because yeah, my dentist so says I need a to- filling and I don't want to do it. Can I just wait 20 <laughs> or 30 years? <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't because you may end up losing the entire tooth. Damn it. I don't know if they can regrow entire teeth yet, but okay. uh, the, the latest research is that they can repair teeth. As in, you have a filling... You put some of this stem cell stuff in there, and then it regrows it. Then it regrows instead of actually having to put a filling in it. Well, that's fucking cool. For sure. That sounds way less drilly. Yeah. When they do the stem cell thing, does it make the sound? Because <laughs> if it doesn't make that sound, I'm game. Does the stem cell sound like that? You know what? I have no idea, but Damn, I it better it not make that like sound. Drill, and as long as long as we can get it, as long as they can get around that drill sound, I'm happy about it because right? the drill sound is awful. And the grinding, it's right? Terrible. Oh, it's just, it's just terrible. It's my least, the least, my least favorite healthcare practitioner out there is the dentist because I really, really just hate getting my teeth drilled on. I'll so be honest, I cried last when it comes to dental I health. Cried. Yeah, <laughs> it's no fun. <laughs> Stupid Dennis. <laughs> Dennis is actually really nice. It's not not their fault. No, I, they have a tough job. And they or deal, whatever. They get paid they so much effing money. I don't feel sorry for them at all. <laughs> yeah. Once you make a quarter million dollars a year, I'm like, my sympathy goes down. Too bad. <laughs> People can be mean to you now. Could be some. No, be mean to you, but like, I don't know. Deal with it. You're a professional. I don't, that's why I'm like that's why I'm like at work. Like sometimes I'll do the doctor's job for them, or I'll do you know just like stuff that they should be handling. And then I'm like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> literally get paid two hundred dollars an hour. Like they can like they can do it. They can go get their own fucking scrubs. I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Distracting. That, no, that's all right. Doctors, no good. Do you work in uh, medical physics then? Yeah, I work in radiation therapy. Yeah, radiation. We, we zap okay. people with radiation, kill their cancer. It's cool. I actually considered that for a brief period of time because I'm actually super interested in healthcare, and I was considering going into medical physics, but I decided against it. Well, you're just doing your PhD, yeah? Is that what you said? I'm sorry. What did, was you, that? did you say you're just doing grad school? Yeah, I was. Con- I mean, I'm getting my PhD in high energy theory, though. My, I was considering doing medical, but I did not, too. 
Yeah, but dude, I know so many people who did PhDs in particle physics and even theoretical particle <laughs> physics, and now they're medical physicists because, um, just, you know, the academic job market's such shit. So, or, or have you not figured that out yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, you know. Yeah, okay. No, <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to be the I, one. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. When I, before, before I even went into this, I knew that yeah. I was uh, not going to continue on in science. Oh, interesting. And I was okay with that. Beca- yeah. Yeah. I, and I was, I was okay with, well, from an academic standpoint, at least, because, mm. uh, because the market is garbage, like you said. It's- and, I was okay with that because I knew that if I was going to do if I was going to do a PhD, I wanted it to be in something that I found really interesting yeah. and that I really enjoyed the work. And this was the only thing that I was actually going to be able to finish my PhD. And I decided. So here yeah, I am. Uh, yeah. And then afterwards, I'm looking at I'm, I'm thinking about going into uh, like consulting or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I pretty much had the exact same thoughts. Like I, I did mine in astrophysics and I'm just like, I'm, I don't know if it's going to last. I'm, I don't know if it's going to work, but I might as well do it in something I actually like and really am interested in. And mm-hmm. cause by the end you hate it anyways and you <laughs> hate your advisor more than anyone in the universe. So, I mean, yeah, you might as well, might as well pick a might subject. Well pick that- something that you can tolerate until you get to the end of that process. Sure. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, really bitter cool. still. I don't know why. <laughs> I graduated like six years ago or seven years ago and I'm still bitter. It was just that traumatic. <laughs> it's how how many years in are you? Uh well technically so I, I had completed a master's degree and then went out into the into the work world and then I decided to go back and finish a PhD. So I guess I'm four I'm if you count my master's degree work along with how many years in now that I am now I'm about four I'm four years in yeah I did about so I, I, I did about seven years of I did seven years of my PhD and one year for postdoc certificate to transition to medical physics so yeah by the end of those seven years I was I was done <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of school yeah I, I'm hoping to be done in the next two years I mean the only the only thing that's nice about the work that I'm doing is that it's completely it's essentially uh, completely up to me. Like I can work on my own pace. Like I don't have to worry about any sort of experiments or anything like that. Well, yeah. Uh, can you tell us about your research? Uh, yeah. So in high energy theory, um, I use a branch of physics. You're probably familiar with it. It's uh, quantum field theory. So it's an amalgamate of quantum mechanics with special relativity. Yep. So the easiest way for those who don't know what it is, um, I describe it as really, really small things moving close to the speed of light in a flat space time. And a flat space time essentially means that <clears throat> we can ignore the effects of gravity. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can ignore the effects of gravity. Uh, anyway, I'm working on a particular type of calculation. I just, this is actually my first research project because I just got started this past fall. I'm working on a particular type of calculation where I'm allowing mass, mass terms and a particular gauge to be complex instead of purely real. Uh, anyway, that's about it's about as in depth as I can get about it without uh, completely that equation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm I mean, sorry. It's, it's essentially a math. It's essentially a math problem. I mean, most of what I do is I, I'm using mathematics to solve physics problems. Okay. I have to tell you a funny, an awesome factoid about medical physics. Okay. In our linear accelerators, we accelerate electrons to like, like, like MV sort of energies or MEV sort of energies. And then we bash them into tungsten. So then it creates, um, X rays through Bremsstrahlung. But anyways, so we bash them into the tungsten and it actually creates forward peaked X rays. So like the X rays are stronger in the middle and less and less strong as you go out. However, that's, f- that's purely, um, uh, the, the only reason for that is relativity because um, in, in the electrons frame of reference, the, the, the Bremsstrung is actually isotropic, but only only because they're going so fast is it forward peaked. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Sounds very And then we have to do all sorts of things to flat, to, to like, to mm-hmm. filter it and flatten the beam and blah, blah, blah. But like the whole, the whole reason though, it's, it's, it's stronger in the middle and less strong as you go out is because of relativity, which makes me excited. That's cool. I'm sorry. That's a, okay. Continue on. <laughs> I like relativity in real life. And that's, no, that's, that's for, that's for radiation treatment. Yeah. You said? Yeah, exactly. Okay. We use something called a linear accelerator to, to zap people with x-rays. Super fun. That's cool. So <laughs> I guess. Hey, that's not a conversation stopper people. <laughs> Jesus. 
Okay, can I also say one thing? Sure. When I was an astro, people, you sit down next to somebody in a plane, you say, they say, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I study astronomy. And then they'll yak your ear off for eight hours of the flight, right? right. But now, but then you sit next to somebody, you're like, what do you do? Oh, medical physics or any other kind of physics. Like, I'm sure you find this. <laughs> High energy physics. And everyone's like, oh, headphones on, <laughs> like magazine open, like... <laughs> Well, space is really interesting to everybody. Know, right. Well, because it's like the grade four thing. They're, they're interested in like, they want to be an astronaut or yeah. a paleontologist, right? So that's what, anyways. Don't get me started. Anyways. <laughs> well, that's stuff, what's really sad about that is that that is super interesting. But when it comes to the marketplace, it's not very, um, it's, it, the market doesn't have much demand for it. Like those are purely academic pursuits. Oh, yeah. So. I mean, there, there, I've known some people who've been successful in, in academia. It's just, it's just, there's a lot of personal sacrifice involved. And you, I think you really have to have a certain personality type that can, that, that just does well with that environment and that, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very challenging. No, it is. Yeah. And I, yeah, as soon as I get my PhD, I'm, I've decided that I'm just going to be done. So you go be I, a grown up. I've had a number of, yeah. Yeah. I get to go be a grown up. Although I kind of, I feel slightly like a grown up right now because I have a, I mean, I don't have like full funding like most other graduate students. So I actually have to work and go to graduate school, which is oh, geez. Well, didn't, kind of fun. I, th- I thought the way it works in the U.S. is your parent just pays a lot of money for somebody to take, <laughs> yeah, take standardized right. tests for you <laughs> and you pretend to be on a sports team and then you get a free ride, no? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I did all of that. And oh, okay, good, good. That. <laughs> well, at least you went the normal route first. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. I, I was still that. I help. was still that poor academically. That my parents went through all that length, and I still. This is what came out. <laughs> so. So I guess we should talk about your website a little bit. <laughs> okay. Do yeah. It. We can go ahead. We can go more into that. Okay. Uh, how, well, how long have you been going on that? About a year. About a year? And yeah. I, I think I started at March or April of last year. And I guess you probably mentioned it before, but what's like the main focus that you are going for? Well, the overall kind of feel for the site, I mean, is to teach people to be a critical thinker. And what exactly does that mean? Well, I have my laws of critical thinking, which I lay out in my very first post. So it's mostly just blog posts at this point. Uh, I am making videos and then there's an accompanying podcast as well, where essentially all of the videos that I make, I just, I just take the audio out of there and I attach it to a podcast. So that way, you know, you can either read it, you can watch it or you can listen to it right. and you get to decide. And with the laws of critical thinking, um, those are essentially my axioms. So those are my, those are, those are what I'm taking to be self evident for what it means to be a critical thinker. Um, based off of everything that I've done over the years, um, all of the, the research into like psychology, philosophy, et cetera. Uh, and this is, this is what I have come up with. So the main goal is to honor the laws of critical thinking and teach people how to master each one of those laws. And then at the end of that, when you master those laws, um, you should be a critical thinker. Therefore, you should be better equipped to go out into the world and make better decisions. If I can teach you, if I can teach people how to make better decisions, better decisions should lead to better outcomes. Whether or not that better outcome is, you know, you make more money or if you have more, you know, a healthier relationship with your spouse, et cetera. So you're going to... It should have a, a, a net positive spillover effect into all aspects of your life. Oh, that... I uh, I think critical thinking definitely would. Uh, but you're not uh, giving out, like, skeptic cards the way some people might. <laughs> Selling it as an identity type thing? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, so it, it's a bit confusing because if you look at the landscape right now, um, and obviously, and I reached out to you because you're, you're a skeptic podcast. So this is, this kind of falls al- along the same lines, uh, with critical thinking and people identify as a skeptic. Uh, and you very easily could take my laws of critical thinking and say, Oh, well, that's what skeptics are. And I'd be perfectly fine with that. Right. I just decided that I wanted to, I, I like the way critical thinking sounds and, um, I wanted to set it up to where I had the laws of critical thinking. And one of the laws is actually to be a skeptic and demand evidence. Um, so yeah. Uh, to me, like if I, when I think of the word skeptic, I think of, oh, you're just, you know, you're not automatically going to believe 
uh, everything that you're told, you'll just remain skeptical. Although, I guess over the past, whatever, 20, 30 years, people kind of expanded what it means to be a skeptic. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's all different, there's all different, var- there's all different variations. Like people are like, oh, I'm a, like a scientific skeptic or I don't know. I've, I've, I've heard, I've heard the full gamut of various terms. And, well, yeah, for a while, was, even climate change deniers wanted to call themselves skeptics, right? Or vaccine yeah, exactly. deniers or like vaccine skeptics. And yes. Yes, so they're GMO skeptics. So, yeah. you know, I'm skeptical about the earth being round. Oh my God. I can't even believe I'm saying that, but yeah, that's a new <laughs> thing. <laughs> if, um, if you haven't seen behind the curve yet, no, um, I haven't. It's a Netflix document. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely worth watching. It's terrifying at the same time too. To think that there are, there are tens of thousands of these people throughout the entire world and they have conventions and they all <laughs> think that the earth is earth is flat. Isn't that, that's, that's the net, that's the documentary that, even though they're trying to prove the earth was flat, they accidentally proved it was round. Is that the one? Yeah. And they spent, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. They spent 20 grand on a particular type of measurement device, some sort of high precision, like GPS measurement device. And <laughs> nice. yeah, they ended up showing that the earth was indeed round. And then they tried to modify the experiment in so many different ways to account for, you know, insert some sort of, I don't know, pseudoscientific belief here to account for this, uh, this, what they believe to be aberrant measurements. And yeah, they just couldn't, the, the level of delusion is, is astronomical. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, as, as a theoretical physicist, you must know that you can kind of manipulate math, to say all sorts of things. I mean, really, I mean, no, no offense, but like, I mean, it tends to be that, theorists put out models but not all of them are correct right so it's hard to necessarily know no no no, absolutely oh yeah yeah no i mean theorists so what theorists do is they put out models right based off of first principles so using 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 the physical theories to um explore areas mathematically Mm. or create models as Mm. you said and then it's up to the experimentalists to go and actually conduct the experiments. And then you match experiments to theoretical yeah. models. And then eventually you weed out the theoretical model, models don't, that don't match experiments. And eventually one is left standing. Yeah, uh, I, I would say arguably uh, I, that... I, I do... Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I, well, I would just say arguably a good model would have measurables, right? Like have something come out of it that's, that's, that, can, that can distinguish this, whether this model... Or to be falsifiable... Um, in terms of empirical evidence, is a, is a good model or is a better model? Well, if it's not falsifiable, it's not science. So, well, I know, but I mean, there's all sorts of arguments, like things like M theory having X number of you know possible options, oh, yeah. which none of which are are, yeah. are are differentiable from one from the other, right? So, yeah, so don't piss off your string theorist whole, friends. <laughs> no, yeah, string string theory is a whole different animal, uh, and that is. Uh, it's pretty esoteric stuff, and I, I mean, I'm hopeful that at some point in the future we're able to start to pick apart experimentally string theory. But I don't know mm-hmm. because of that the energy scales that they work at. I don't, I don't know when that's going to happen. So, what kind of energy scales do they work in? Sorry, just, just off, just curious. Uh, isn't like Atlas does like TeV, right? Like, am I wrong? Yeah, so at the LHC, the current, I think, high, the highest energy levels right now, they're in shutdown right now. They're in shutdown mode for the next two years uh, for upgrades, and then they will be able to go up to, I think, like 15 to 16 TEV. Don't quote, don't quote me on that, though, because uh, <laughs> I can't, I, I don't recall the exact number, but I think it's, okay. yeah, it's TEV, so tera electron volts, so trillions. So they're going to like an order of magnitude um, more higher. Like many ish. orders of magnitude higher though. Than what they've been previously? Of, okay. Yeah. The, yeah. For certain aspects of string theory. Uh, and one of the things too oh, okay. about string theory, uh, there is a, okay. So there's a theory called supersymmetry. Yep. Which, yeah. So, okay. So, so supersymmetry is completely theoretical. It hasn't been observed experimentally. But part of string theory's success is the is the fact that string theory has, or is the fact that um, so theorists at one point they took supersymmetry and then they 
they built it into string theory. Uh, and that's where your fermionic states come from. So as you're probably familiar, there's bosons or whole integer, uh, whole integer, integer spin particles. And then there's fermion, half integer spin particles. And you don't have any fermionic states in string theory without super, super symmetry, at least to the best of my knowledge, this is how I understand it. And we have yet to find any sort of supersymmetric particles um, at, at, the, at the LHC. So mm -hmm. we were really, really hopeful to find supersymmetric particles at the LHC, and we did not. Thing. So, yeah, actually, the LHC, more or less, besides the Higgs boson, has been a bit of a bust. Yeah, but the Higgs boson is pretty I mean, good. I mean, yeah, that's the kind of a big deal of the stand. Yeah, but I mean, what we what physicists really want is we want to poke holes so that way that can give us some direction to go in. I guess, and yeah. We, we didn't discover. We yeah. haven't discovered anything anything super interesting other than the fact that we've completed essentially the standard model of particle physics, but we don't have anything else to go off of. Honestly, that's why so I didn't go into that's why I didn't go into high energy physics. So I was just like, it's just all like. Proving that the center ball is it right? Is it? Oh yeah, it's right. Okay. Well, what about this part? Is this right? Yeah, that part's right too. Okay. Well, like, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of, I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think two, 2013, 2012 when, when the Higgs was announced. So it's been a while. Yeah, and they, like I said, they haven't found anything else interesting, which is why high energy theory is even more of a graveyard these days. And they really, right. really don't recommend that anybody go into it. If you're looking to stay, if you're looking for the academic route, which I decided ultimately not. So it was either I was going to do computational physics or uh, high energy theory. And mm -hmm. I just decided that I like, I like analytical calculations more. So mm -hmm. and quantum field theory really interests me from my, from an actual physical theory standpoint versus what I can be using in computational physics, which is um, a bunch of stuff, solid state stuff. So I, mm. or material science, I'm not super interested in that. So. Mm. Well, it's wholly different methodology, right? Numerical, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Like it's yeah, yeah. really different day-to-day -day existence. So do you like, okay, sorry, an analytical, th sorry, this is really nerdy. This is, I always wanted to know this. An analytical theoretical physicist, do you like, get to work or get to school or whatever, like sharpen a fucking pencil and just write shit? Like, is that what you do? <laughs> like, like, I mean, like, is you putting, pen, are you, are you putting pen to paper? Yeah. Whiteboard, whatever you use. Like, are you like writing, is that like you solving integrals and shit? Like, yeah. I mean, right now, cool. <laughs> you have the coolest job. <laughs> cool. I mean, there's some coding, like I have to use Mathematica and stuff like that to, or pro a program like Mathematica to, st to solve complex integrals. But mm. <clears throat> um, I mean, that's essentially what I'm doing right now is just a math problem. So it's pencil to paper. And sometimes like, I use pencil or sometimes in the spirit of Einstein, <laughs> I, use a, I, use a, I use a fountain pen because to me, math is like a second language. I don't, oh. I mean, I make mistakes and whatnot, but I like mathematics is to me like writing English at this point. Well, you're like, I'm going to solve this one by parts. No, I'm going to, this one's a U substitution. <laughs> like I love, that's awesome. I want to do that. I don't remember anything anymore. I could present a problem, but I remember that partial differential equations were easier than ordinary differential equations for some reason. Anyways. Yeah. I actually had the complete opposite experience. Oh, I think I had a bad prof <laughs> for ODs. Did you? Okay. Yeah, he's a jerk. He had good stories though about canoeing in northern BC. He I would always tell us a good story, but other than that, it was boring. <laughs> Anyways, you know, teacher teacher makes or break it makes or break a class in my opinion based off of all of the years of coursework that I've done. I've definitely taken very challenging courses with a professor who just knew how to teach, and I thought it was I found the course rather not that it wasn't challenging, but it, certainly wasn't impossible where I was banging my head against the wall. No, I, I, I agree with you. E easier courses with teachers that were just impossible to understand and didn't make it fun. And yeah, it was just kind of a, a slog to get through. So 
When I was in grad school, um, a guy came from Vancouver at the University of Victoria, uh, University of uh, British Columbia, UBC. He, I can't remember what his name is, but he <clears> won a Nobel Prize in Physics. And kind of famously, when you win a Nobel Prize in Physics, then your research career is over because you, you're too important to actually do re- real research anymore. <laughs> nice. like, and so it's like some people they say, oh, it's like the it's like it's a death sort of thing. So this guy, after he won his Nobel Prize in Physics, he decided to switch his area of research to physics education. And yeah. that's what he does. He's, okay. He researches the best way to teach. He, he focused on like first year undergrads, but how to teach um, people physics. Like what, like, for example, he's, he, he, I remember him distinctly saying like, you can, you can take, um, first year undergrads and you, you can test them at the beginning and they don't know about Newton's third law. They don't, they, they don't really have a sense for if you, if you apply a force to an object that applies an equal force back to you. Um, okay. and you can get them by give, taking the course, you can get them to say at the end of the course, yes, there will be an equal and opposite force. But you, what he, what he said, they did some other kind of testing and other ways and nuanced ways of looking at it. He says, but you can't, it's hard to get them to believe it. And the way to get them to retain <laughs> physics is to believe that this is not just the thing you have to say to pass your physics exam, but no, like Newton's third law is real and friction is real. And like, it's actually the real world that we live in. And so he would kind of talk about how to get students to actually internalize that. It was very interesting. So this sounds interesting. No, that's really interesting because uh, physics, it seems like all of the undergraduates, at least in the courses that I took, they, they, most of them just read physics. Everyone I talked to, you talk about, like when I say what I'm doing, like younger kids are like, "Oh, you're doing physics? Ugh, that's awful." So, well, and uh, or, people, yeah, they I mean, they think physics is like, okay, they're given a problem, they're given m and v, so they can now they they which formula? Oh, this formula has m and v, and I can find e. Like, no, like that's not, <laughs> <laughs> that's not physics. <laughs> it's not what you're supposed to do, eh? No. Sorry, I get worked out. I'm sorry. Website. I was oh, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I mean. I was actually thinking that that kind of concept of of teaching people about the real world effect of such and such a thing that so that they actually absorb the information that could be used in teaching critical thinking. <laughs> if, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, what what my goal is with all of this is to teach people the concepts and then have them apply it in everyday life. And in every, so far it's just, it's mostly just blog posts at this point. Uh, I try to give real world examples and then dissect them. So that way people can get a better understanding. I mean, it's not, it's not like I have developed full blown courses and whatnot, but right. uh, it's mostly uh, the cliff notes version of it because people these days are so I don't want to criticize people, but I mean, most people are like intellectually lazy. They want, they want things spoon fed to them. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to absorb something or have something presented to me as in as small of a, or compressed of a soundbite as possible, make it as easy as possible for me to consume it type of deal. So. Well, I mean, <laughs> me, me, memeable, really. That's the best way. <laughs> yeah, if, that's if right. It, if you taught to me in a meme, that's the best way to do it. And I do make memes with each one of the posts. I do make memes, but I, I mean, I can't, I can't express obviously the depth of what I'm communicating in, in you know, three sentences in a meme or two sentences in a meme. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, well, essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to communicate these things in as small a space as possible to just communicate the essence of what it is. So that way, you can go and you can practice it, read through it again and t- until you internalize it and then go out and go out and hopefully um, use it in your life. And hopefully it will help you to make better decisions and see the errors in your thinking. And I would agree that I'm totally getting more intellectually lazy. I don't know if it's like I'm getting older or it's just like, like, it just like, I want to listen, listen to a book. I don't want to read a book. Like just, yeah. just, I will lay here and let the words wash over me. Like, I don't know. Like I, like I was telling Renee before I got here, I, I had a four page article to read for this podcast for later. And I'm just like, it, it was a struggle. Like I, I probably checked <laughs> Facebook eight times while reading the damn article. <laughs> like, I don't even know. Yeah. Our attention spans aren't as long as they should be anymore. Like, it seems like. Like people used to think, yeah, not, think uh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, go. 
I, 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 think, I think a lot of that is because of our smart devices. Our smartphones are very yeah. distracting to us, and we have access. We have access to so much, to so much. And I see myself as soon as I get like bored, and even if I'm, I've done this before. Like if I'm having a conversation with somebody, and suddenly like I, I get bored and check out, then I'll start looking at my phone for something that's more stimulating. And it's like that's just so rude. <laughs> But that's what happens a lot of the time is we want to be constantly stimulated. So, you know, if we're, if we're attempting to focus on one aspect and there's a lull for, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, you're like, oh, I need to be intellectually <laughs> stimulated. So you, you reach over to your, you reach over to your, your cell phone and, you know, you scroll through your social media feed. So. I, I'm so never not on my phone. It's just how I am. <laughs> how did we get like this? Do you remember like in the 90s or 80s when you just like existed? Yeah. Like I you're know. in the waiting room of the doctor and you just fucking looked at a magazine or stared at the wall. You I don't know. 10 year old magazines. Yeah. yeah like sketchy one, like sticky sort of. Ugh, not. I can't even remember the last time I actually finished a book. <laughs> I'm trying so fucking hard. I've started so many books. I've got three books on the go. I can't fucking finish yep. them. Oh man. You got to you got to push through. You got to push through. Uh, I noticed that for me, like I still for I still like to read, but there are some books where I like put them down after 3 quarters and I just can't finish them and I don't know why. And for a while I was on a streak where I was only reading 3 quarters of a book and then I would put it down. Okay, question. But, Do you yeah, find you got to just got to push through. Are they non-fiction <laughs> or are they fiction? I only read nonfiction. Okay, so I think this is my problem too because I was like, I listen to a lot of podcasts, listen, you know, what like the radio, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I want to read that book. And I want to, you know, it's interesting things, like like nonfiction yeah. stuff that people are reading. But I find it a slog to get through them. Whereas I can read some fantasy shit about like some <laughs> like steampunk imaginary world and, you know, 19 or 1890s fucking, uh, Rotterdam. And I'm just like, this is amazing. I'll get through that shit. But like, Things about the real world. I'm like, I don't know about this shit. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying. I'm going to finish uh, a fucking yeah, book. No, well, Good for you. Yeah, fiction, <laughs> fiction is definitely a far easier read than nonfiction. But I am immensely curious about the world, so I like to do, I like to read nonfiction books on things that interest me. So, for example, right now, I'm reading a book called Nudge, and it's all about how. It's all about essentially decision optimization. I'm kind of on a kick right now with that that sort of stuff. But I've read books on AI. I recently read a book called The Hum- uh, Laws of uh, Laws of Human Nature, which is a really interesting book about human psychology. So, You're a smart person. I still have- <laughs> Good for you. I'm a. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I just like I just like learning about the world. Like, uh, I don't know. It's just um, existence in and of itself is rather bizarre. And there's, you know, human beings. We live in a time period where we're so spoiled we don't even realize it. We have an embarrassment of riches, and like when yeah. it comes to modern modern living and whatnot. So I figure I might as well just try to, with my spare time, try to try to learn, try to learn about it. Well, like in the like 1800s, like when novel or yeah, like I think early 1800s, the novels novels first came out. They were considered like, like just, <laughs> just garbage. Like it's just a waste of your mind to yeah. spend time reading a thousand page tomb novel. Oh God, what's wrong with you? You know, like damn. Like now I'm just like I'm lucky to get through a book. Like I'm just, like any book. I'll get a comic <laughs> book. I don't know. Give me something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. I don't, I, I mean, I don't well, want to make excuses, but I, I don't seem to have the time as that I used to have to like, just sit down and read. I always have to, some other demand on my time. So, uh, maybe it's partly that. And then you just fit in like whatever distraction you can in the time you have allotted. Not yeah, to make I mean, excuses. Some have just, <laughs> yes. Some people have like super busy work schedules. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly, I would consider myself rather privileged. I mean, I do have some downtime to myself because I, I don't have like family responsibilities or anything like that at this point in my life. So um, I do, I just kind of have to worry about myself. So I have, um, I have free time and I like to read, but yeah, I totally understand because I know my dad likes to read, but uh, he, he has fatherly responsibilities for my two youngest siblings and he's got work and a family, you know, 
my mom and all of that. So it's, uh, yeah, he likes to read, <laughs> but he doesn't ever have time to read. Yeah. So, so maybe you're just too busy. Maybe it's not. I am busy. Okay. I'm a single parent, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But like, I don't know. I, I do put, like, I put, um, like, ebooks on my phone. I find I get through books better if I have them on my, like, available. Right. Um, and I'll get through them, but sort of. But like, <laughs> even still, like, just reading a book for up, you know, like a couple of paragraphs at a time is yeah. kind of agonizing and not really the way I like to read. <laughs> like, it's, I don't know. Whatever. First world problem, I guess. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> These are the things you complain about when you're not starving. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot to be grateful for. Just, you know, but things happen, but hey. So you've got a website. <laughs> I do have a website. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, uh, yeah, I have, I have the website and then I'm also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And I also have a LinkedIn page too. And what else? YouTube channel. Yeah, because I make videos, so. I put all the videos on the YouTube channel. Okay. And everything can be found yeah, anyone, at the, at the website though. Yeah. Everyone, everything can be found at the website, uh, intelligence speculation.com. And I am actually looking, I just posted, just posted it today. I'm going to be looking to find somebody to help me because I'm starting to become overwhelmed with everything. So trying to, trying to reach out, see if anybody is interested in science and critical thinking communication that would be interested in, uh, developing uh, some of the content for intelligent speculation. So if anyone who's listening is interested, uh, just go to my website and shoot me an email. Um, I mean, some of the requirements are that you have to, you have to understand science. You need to have, you should probably have at least a degree in science. If you're going to be oh, talking about science. Yeah. It always helps. Keep the degrees. <laughs> a lot of work. They are, uh, but uh, there's something to be said about all that work, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> Hopefully right. Hopefully you learn something. <laughs> learn some stuff. Yeah. I mean, a degree isn't absolutely required. I mean, if you're a some sort of science wizard uh, and you haven't completed your bachelor's degree yet, then, of course, I'd be interested in <laughs> hearing, a, hear, hearing what you have to say and reading through whatever sort of, uh, whatever sort of um, writing material that you wanted to provide for me, but... I've had uh, this discussion with uh, a philosopher friend of mine in the past about how he has studied ethics for a long time. He's almost got his PhD in in philosophy and, uh, Mm -hmm. and people like think that they can argue with him about ethics and, but he's, and I mean, ethics are a thing that everybody has an opinion about, but you can, defer to an expert who has a broader knowledge on this subject. And I, I think a yeah. lot of things are like that, right? Like everybody thinks their, their opinion matters, but we should be deferring to people who actually ex are experts in these things. It's really hard. Like even like, you know, I did my PhD in astrophysics. Well, I did my PhD in a very specific field. Like, I don't know, like my opinion on whatever star forming <laughs> regions or whatever. Right. Like, I don't know. You've got somebody you, actually studies that. Somebody and- <laughs> studies that, and you gotta ask them. I don't know. Yeah. Like it's so specific. Specific. I don't know. Yeah. Expertise. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I agree a hundred percent. Actually, the fourth law of critical thinking is uh, intellectual humility. So understanding that you're not going to know everything and that you're not you know, you're most likely wrong about something currently and it's going to be updated as we learn more about the world um, that you're not google having access to google doesn't make you an expert that experts <laughs> are still very much important in this world <laughs> wait, wait, are you are you quite sure that you can really be a th- theoretical physicist and have intellectual humility that does not that doesn't compute <laughs> dude like that is not a th- i don't know well, am man I supposed to be, am i just supposed to walk around super arrogant <laughs> Thinking I know everything? Well, the theoretical physicists I've met do that. <laughs> Other than you, man, you're the best one I've met. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a problem with really smart people, though, is that they, unless they're polymaths, I mean, there are polymaths out there who are just brilliant, like have really, really high IQs, and they have just deep knowledge in everything. And I certainly don't consider myself a polymath. 
Well, you know, uh, you know but, what though, you get people of all kinds. You know, I mean, if you look at like the, the the titans of 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 physics, or whatever. I mean, like I, I'm so my background is astronomy, so let me bring it there. But like, um, Chandrasekhar was a very famous theoretical astrophysicist, mm-hmm. and he was famously humble and 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 kind, and you know, and just just very a very nice man. And then I, I believe one of his, although an observer, one of his contemporary. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think he was actually supposed to be, to be his supervisor at some point, but it, the relationship didn't work out well. Like Eddington was supposed to be just be a, a dick, right? Like just like a, a pompous asshole, right? So I mean, you get all all kinds, and you don't. I'm I'm just making a joke, but I have I I have met a, an an inordinate number of people with a lot of self confidence <laughs> in in physics in general, science in general, but theoretical physics seems to be also special. I don't know. That's my sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, well. The- well, because um, they're put up on pedestals, right? They're kind of glorified by popular media. They're supposed to be like the smartest right. scientists. Like only Sheldon Cooper. Theoretical physicists. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sheldon Coopers, et cetera. And, they, you know, we are very smart people. I mean, but there's a lot of people with comparable IQs who work in other fields. They just chose not to go into theoretical physics. And for a anybody of any profession to think that somehow they were going to know everything is incredibly arrogant. And I'm happy making that statement. And if I, you know, people want to attack me because of that, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're not going to know everything. Not every human being knows everything. I don't care how high of an IQ you have or how many degrees you have. You are not going to know everything. It's impossible at this point based off of everything that we've learned further. Every day we're learning something new. I don't know how many thousands of publications come out every day. Uh, so you know, and furthermore, not only can you not know everything that humanity as a whole knows, but humanity as a whole knows only a fraction of what yeah, there is to know. Of the right? things, like, even, <laughs> right? Like the sheer magnitude of the things is t- just too much. Yeah, and this is part of what makes science so interesting, right? Because we're always learning. So for somebody to take a position of, well, you know, I'm I'm going to be I'm an arrogant theoretical physicist and you know, you should you should bow before me. I mean, I I just yeah. That's no, don't worry. There's very arrogant medical physicists. Don't worry. It's not. It ain't <laughs> unique. Like, <laughs> that's true. In the medical profession, I think of uh, I think what was that? Doctor Strange. She was pretty um, the Marvel character. You guys see that movie? Yeah, love that movie. By Benedict Cumber. It was played by Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. I believe that's how you pronounce that actor's name. It was yeah, Cumberbatchable. He's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he, Dr. Strange in that particular movie. So he's an MD, PhD, clearly brilliant guy, and he's super arrogant. So, but I've come across those types as well, not just in physics. Oh, yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, there, there is can, something. I'm that you, I was going to say, you probably, I mean, I haven't worked a whole lot in the medical field, like had access to hospitals and things of that nature. I've just worked in smaller, like small business types of medical offices. But with the uh, the high pay scales for some of those individuals, I've also noticed that people's arrogance tends to increase based off of how much money they're making. Maybe or whether there, or not there, it's justified, I don't know. There may be a selection bias there too, like the people, because confidence makes other people confident in you, right? Like that's like just a, a, a natural. For, so yeah. I, I find that oftentimes the people who tend to be most successful are the people who just believe in themselves so much, and everyone just kind of buys it. Like I, I do think that that's. They don't um, actually have to be smart. Eh? I, I think, well, yeah. or, or they don't have to actually. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's very true. Yeah, I, I just find that. But what I was going to say is there's something humbling about being a medical physicist because like medical wor- world is so hierarchical and the physicians, the, like the radiation mm-hmm. oncologists are above you in like the hierarchy. Okay. They, they, you know, people doesn't, don't say it that way, but it's true. Certainly they make three times as much money, right? So, <laughs> But so what happens is like I went to to school just as long as they went to school and technically I'm a doctor and they're a doctor. But let me tell you, medical physicists never get called doctor so and so. I just get called Lisa, right? Like there's no like except except here's what happened: the phone guy came, replaced my phone, and he set me up in the system as Doctor Glass oh, nice. because I wasn't in my office at the time. And 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 it it says Doctor Glass like on my um on my door, which I made them do when I moved there because it made me feel better. But anyways, so they so they. 
So you didn't, I wasn't there. So he, he entered me into the phone system as Dr. Glass. And from then on, whenever I call anyone, everyone just laughs. Okay. And they answer their phone. They're like, oh, hi, Dr. Glass. That's the only time I ever get called that is when people are like, yeah, you're not a real doctor. Jeez. They went to school for seven years. They got him MD in four years. Like, fuck them. Like, no, no respect. I'm just saying there's something humbling about medical physics. Fair enough. But I mean, like, I'm crawling. With, uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask if you worked with radiologists as well, or just um, or just uh, radiative oncologist, or just the oncologist. We sometimes work with radiologists, but radiologists tend to take images and diagnose illnesses, right? And by the time we get the patients there, we already know, right? Like, but sometimes, like, well, like in terms of recurrence and stuff, we, yeah, we like have at conferences and stuff. We, there's definitely collaborations there. But what I was going to say is something that's extra humbling is like I'm I'm crawling around on the dirty OR floor underneath <laughs> some guys like rectum with a freaking probe stuck in there and blood dripping everywhere, and I'm trying to get cables connected right and get, get the ultrasound <laughs> talking to the freaking computer. That's the glamour of my job, right? So I mean, anyway, it just cleaning blood out of like catheter tubes because trying to like make sure to anyways <laughs> sounds so glamorous the way you put it right it, it's not humbling at all it, it's it's all it's all beautiful you must feel like a god at the end of the day exactly right <laughs> so sorry but yeah <laughs> so yeah there it is <laughs> there it is i know but i freaking analytical mathematics like a theoretical physics level level with a freaking fountain pen is like awesome i'm gonna have this image in my head tonight like it makes me happy to know that somebody is out there doing that i'm glad you exist jonathan oh well thank you yeah i'm <laughs> i'm having a good time uh good time certainly a good time doing it and you know what i was gonna say is uh so for when i was younger i was an artist and i i and i still draw sometimes to this day and there's a lot of parallels between when I do art and when I do theoretical physics because I'm um, there's this tactileness to it. Like I'm actually right. instead of like typing code or something like that, but I'm actually like using a pen and I'm drawing and I get this weird sort of it's almost like ASMR or like flow state. So ASMR is like when you look at certain visuals or hear certain sounds, you kind of get like a body buzz almost. Mm. Um, it's this weird kind of sensation. But when I look, when I look at mathematics, sometimes um, I get that sensation and I, 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 I can get into flow states very easily when I, when I do that, because it reminds me so much of drawing. It's really bizarre that, but that's the best way I can describe it to people. Like when I actually do my work, uh, because yeah, I tend to just, it, it really, sorry. It, I was going to say it like, yeah, like it just really pulls me into it. <laughs> I'm sorry I keep interrupting you. There's a certain amount of lag going on that I apologize. But what I was going to say is I kind of call those kinds of states meditative, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like where you just, you're just so in the moment of whatever you're doing. You're not worried about tomorrow or what, you know, what so-and-so said to you yesterday. It's just, yeah, it's in the moment. Anyways. Yeah, anyway, That's I just interesting. Like throw that out there. So <laughs> I, uh, I like what I do. That's cool. So I guess we're coming up here on close to an hour, so we might as well uh, direct people to where they can get your stuff again, and then uh, we'll let you go. Okay. Yeah, so uh, www.intelligentspeculation.com, and that would be the website. Everything is there. So like I said, I have a bunch of social media uh, YouTube and all of that, but you can find that all in the upper right-hand corner. So for those that are interested, I generally try to post on social media at least once, once a day, sometimes more. It's not related always. Well, I mean, it's, it's related <laughs> material, but it's not, I'm not like posting new blog posts every day. So like fun facts about science or right. anything related to critical thinking. So. Very cool. Thanks for joining us. And, uh, I guess have a good one. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Take yeah, care. Thank you. All right, bye. Hello, Elon Dubrovsky here, local podcaster and science enthusiast. Are your podcasts viewing too much bunk all the time? Are your podcasts constantly making things up, driving you crazy? Are your podcasts full of shit? Think there's no answer? You're so stupid! There is! The Reality Check 
Finally, there is a fun, skeptical Canadian podcast. The San Francisco Hospital Study on... <laughs> on paper? <crippling>? Origami. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys, let me just... Can you make a reel of Elan's paper shuffling? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make it like... That sounds amazing! Is your music player a computer, a phone, or an in-between? That doesn't matter, because we work on all platforms! The Reality Check. You'll be checked! So head on down to trcpodcast.com. That's the home of The Reality Check. Subscribe! Okay, thanks for listening. I'm going to cover a couple things before I do the outro stuff. First, I have to apologize for the lateness of the episode. All my excuses are bad, uh, so I'm not going to bother. But I do apologize, and I will try to stay stay on schedule in the future. Uh, I also want to apologize to the patrons, because there's not an extended version of this episode, and there isn't any bonus content from it. I have one more interview in the can with Peter Coffin on postmodernism and Marxism. And that has a little bonus content on it, talking about some of the struggles he was facing at the time of the interview. And uh, hopefully I'll have that out next week. I'm also working on setting up a couple of interviews now that my work life has slowed down. So hopefully I can get a new one out um, in decent time. If not, I may re-release one of the episodes that Destin and I did from the Positively Skeptical Project. Um, either way, there will be content coming out every week for regular subscribers. And of course, patrons will only be charged for new content if I get it out each week. Uh, so that's it for that. Uh, here's some closing stuff. First, uh, we got a new review on iTunes, uh, from Richard Lounsbury. He gave us five stars and he titled it controversial. Uh, it says, I love listening when I agree and enjoy losing my mind when I don't agree at all. Definitely gets you thinking, even if you don't like the topic or the viewpoints. Destin's humor is good comic relief. Well, thanks, Richard. Uh, I appreciate the five stars, even though you probably don't always feel like we deserve it. Uh, But I definitely appreciate the uh, review. And I appreciate that you listen, even though you don't agree with us all the time. Particularly me. (laughs) So... We definitely want more reviews. If you like the show, then go on iTunes and give us a rating and a review, and we'll read it on the air. If you want to help the show get more exposure, then this is one of the ways you can do that. And uh, also, you can rate and review us on Podchaser and Podknife. I have a link in the show notes on our website, brainstormblog.net, for our Podchaser account. And uh, anybody who goes and rates and reviews us there, it would be a big help. I'd really appreciate it. Or I would really appreciate it. Um, Patrons. We got a couple new patrons last month. Uh, I think Jesse, Richard, and Keith all became patrons, and we really appreciate that. And then uh, recently, Richard went from uh, critical thinker level to skeptic level. So that puts him among the top patrons. Uh, And I'm going to say thank you to all our patrons, but our top patrons get a special shout out. Thank you to the Flying Spaghetti Monster, Sauce Be Upon Him. Destin doesn't suck that much. Thank you to Aaron Young. Daryl Goosen, Rob Geiger, Larry Wilson, the Utah Outcasts, and now thank you to Richard Lounsbury. You can be a top patron by signing up at the skeptic level or above on Patreon, which is $5 per episode or higher. For all the things, you can check out the show notes on our website, brainstormblog.net, and on our hosting page, thebrainstormpodcast.com. Thanks to our financial supporters, Aaron, Bob Glenn, by reading this aloud, I agree to give Freethinker215 a free blowjob. Daryl, Destin doesn't suck that much. Driffa, the flying spade a monster sauce be upon him. Jesse, Kayla, Kim, Keith, Kim, Larry, Magnus, Richard, Rob, Stephanie, the Utah Outcasts, and Zach. If you want to join them and help the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast. I need, I think only, oh, also the Podunk Polymath. I keep forgetting to add him into my notes here. <laughs> but when we hit 20 patrons on the brainstorm podcast patreon then i will stop reading off all the names and we'll only read the top patrons uh that is patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast or you can do a one-time donation at paypal.me slash brainstorm podcast 
And if you like Brainstorm's symbol, like stuff, our logo and our uh, uh, designs, t-shirt designs, then you can get that at tpublic.com slash store slash brainstorm dash podcast dash gear. Oh, our next live show is on April 12th, and our guests will be Tom and Cecil from the podcast Cognitive Dissonance. If you don't know them, make sure to check out their website, dissonancepod.com. I want to give a big thanks to Jonathan Maloney for joining us on the Skeptic Studio. Uh, you can find his stuff at intelligencespeculation.com. Uh, I think it's important to help p- spread critical thinking, so for sure, check out that website and keep up with what he's doing. Thanks to Dave for our intro music. Thanks to Aaron Rabbi from Embrace the Void for doing the voiceover for our intro. You can find his stuff at voidpod.com. Thanks to Alex Kepper Murdoch for doing the voiceover for for our ads. And thanks to Jason Camo for our outro music. You can find his stuff at alostdatamind.com. All music played is either with permission or under the SoCan license to play. For more information on SoCan, you can check out the music license info page on our website, brainstormblog.net. Remember to give us a rating, a thumbs up, or a fave on your podcatcher of choice. Join our Facebook group, like our page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our subreddit, sign up for our newsletter, share the show, and spread the word. The more you share, comment, and like our stuff, the more it helps the show grow. Thanks for listening, and remember, the truth matters.